Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this panel meeting of the Education, Libraries and Lifelong Learning Cabinet Panel, Wednesday the 30th of June, and you're all very welcome. At the beginning of the meeting, I am obliged to read the following announcement. With regard to COVID-19 attendance at this meeting, due to the coronavirus pandemic, the Council will be holding this meeting electronically. Members of the public may also attend this meeting in an electronic capacity, and there is a link on the Council's website for them to do so. Members of the Council are asked to keep their microphones switched off until called to speak and to switch their microphones off once they have finished speaking. Cameras may be left on throughout the meeting if members wish. If you are experiencing connection or any other technical difficulties, it may help to switch your camera off. Cameras should be switched on if and when speaking in the meeting. To indicate a wish to speak, members should use the raise hand function. Use of the meeting chat function is exclusively for voting. And at the end of any debate on each item of business, there will be a vote. Members should vote using the chat function, as I've mentioned, by indicating for, against or abstain. I will declare the result after each vote. Depending on the length of the meeting, breaks of at least 15 minutes will be held every two hours and will be taken after a speaker in the debate has finished speaking. If we are voting, the vote will be conducted before the break is taken. Other breaks will be incorporated as appropriate. My understanding is that as at the 24th of June and subsequently, there are no membership changes. And I'm going to now ask members, please, to introduce themselves and I will go round the table. Uh, Christopher Alley, if you'd like to just say, um, obviously, we know your name now, but uh, which area do you represent and perhaps which party you represent as well? Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, as you all know, my name is Christopher Alley. I am the Conservative uh, re uh, can, uh, re representative uh, for South Foxy and Eastbury and uh, I was recently elected in May. Thank you very much indeed. Do you prefer to be called Chris or Christopher? I have no real preference, whatever okay. somebody, yeah. Right, uh, Lawrence, Lawrence Brass. My name is Lawrence Brass. I'm the Liberal Democrat member for Bushy North. Thank you, Lawrence, welcome. Caroline Clapper. Uh, thank you, Chair. Firstly, apologies that um, my camera is not on. I seem to be suffering from some technical issues. Uh, my name is Caroline Clapper. I am the Conservative member for Watling Division, which covers Radlett, Aldenham and Elstree. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Fiona Hill. Thank you. I'm Fiona Hill, Conservative member for Royston Eastern Ermine and Deputy Exec member for this panel. Thank you, Fiona. Paula Hiscox. Thank you, Chair. I'm Paula Hiscox. I represent Rickmansworth West, which is Rickmansworth Town, Mill End, Maple Cross, Heronsgate. And um, I'm new to this panel too. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Chris Lloyd. Yep. Hi, hi Terry. I'm um, a newly elected councillor for Croxley Green. And obviously have been in your patch when we were last able to do runs, if you remember, uh, that when you were chairman of Decorum. So uh, look forward to joining you on this committee. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Jan Madden. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Jan Madden. I'm uh, independent councillor for Hemel Hempstead South East and um, returning to this committee after an eight year absence. Delighted to be back. Thank you, Jan. Nice to see you back. Uh, Mark Mills Bishop. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Mr Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. Mark Mills Bishop, a uh, Conservative member for Frampstead End and Turnford and a member of this panel. Michael Muir. He's not with us yet, Chair. We're following up with him. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Vince. Um, Labour member for Boreham Wood North, newly elected and new to this panel. Thank you. 
Thank you. Welcome, Michelle. Mark Watkin. Good afternoon, Chairman. Good afternoon, everybody. Mark Watkin, <coughs> um, the Dem uh, member for Nascot and Park, which is a division in Watford. And uh, I have the pleasure of being your opposite number in terms of the opposition spokesperson for education. Thank you very much indeed. And I am Terry Duris, and I'm Conservative member for the Bridgewater Division, which spans a number of parishes uh, around the Gadstons, Mark Yate and Northern Hemel Hempstead. So uh, welcome to you all. Welcome back to those who have returned and a very warm welcome to our new new members. So apologies, we have none, but it may be that Michael Muir has will send an apology, but uh, colleagues in Democratic Services are chasing that up. Um, members' interests, I would ask you um, if you have a declarable interest when it comes to any item on the agenda, if you could state it at that time. Um, I am aware that we do, we will have one later on. Um, the, just to alert you and let you know that the membership and remit of the panel um, and I, I have to read this out for everybody here, but equally and importantly for anybody who is watching in. And that is to note the membership of the panel as stated above and the remit, which is as follows. School improvement and standards, including hearts for learning. School place planning and admissions, relations with maintained schools and academies, further and higher education. Skills and lifelong learning, including Hertfordshire Adult and Family Learning Service. Culture, including the libraries, museums and the arts. Localism, volunteering, relations with the voluntary sector, local strategic partnerships, relations with town and parish councils and the Armed Forces Covenant Board. And if you were able to join us for the induction session this morning, you will have had a flavour of the extent and the, the, the range that uh, this panel covers. So now we come to the approval, I hope, of the minutes of the former Education, Libraries and Localism panel held on the 10th of February 2021. I would ask you if you would please be kind enough to vote for, against or abstain in the chat box. Thank you very much indeed, Stephanie. We can note that the minutes are noted. Thank you all indeed. So uh, public partition, partitions, public petitions, there are none notified. Um, we now come to item four, the Hertfordshire Skills and Employment Strategy. And we welcome uh, to this meeting, Kate Briley, the Senior Policy Officer for Hertfordshire County Council. And also delighted to welcome Caroline Cartwright, um, who is the lead officer for um, the um, skills strategy, along with Norman Jennings um, from the Hertfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership. I believe that Norman is unable to join us, but I understand that Caroline is with us, I hope. Um, and I, I don't I, see. I know I am you? with you. I've just had a notification. I've not, just never seen that before saying. Teams is not allowing your camera to work. I've never seen that before. Oh, I don't know. Well, do you want to, Caroline? Do you want to drop out and come back in again, or do you want yes. to, uh, do you want to carry on? I will drop out and come back in again. It's always a good idea. And turn it off and put it back on again. I'll be back in one moment. Okay, that's fine. And whilst you're doing that, we could also go to Michael Muir, who is going to tell us his name. Um, and also the party he represents and the area that he is the member for. So good afternoon, Michael. 
and he's going to do it without us hearing anything. You're muted, Michael. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Terry. I represent uh, uh, Bulldog uh, completely, all the town, and uh, about a fifth of one ward in Letchworth, uh, Letchworth East. Okay, and you are a Conservative? Yes. I just thought I'd add that little bit for clarity. Good. Are you are you back with us visibly now, Caroline? No, what a shame. It says video isn't working. Oh. I've, just, I've just noticed in the chat someone else had that problem, didn't they? OK. You can hear me, uh, though. Oh, we can hear you loud and clear. So um, so let, let us move on. But uh, you are very welcome. And I'm going to ask Kate yeah. to introduce this. Before you do, Kate, I think that um, it's fair to say that skills and employment strategy it, it it came to this panel or the previous panel a little while ago, um, and I think that one of the one of the things, Michael, can you turn your camera off before you start cavorting around the room, please? Unless you are right, are you settled now, Michael Muir? I think you are. I was going to say. Um, that one of the things that COVID has, has shown up is the need for people potentially to, to skill, be skilled and to reskill going forward. Um, and in that context, I think that the whole concept and the whole essence of, of sk the skills agenda and lifelong learning is so important to us. And that's one of the reasons why I'm delighted that that has now found, I hope it's permanent place it has been slightly nomadic in, in past history, um, but it's now found its permanent place within this panel and this portfolio. So without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Kate. Thank you, Chairman. Um, good afternoon, panel. This is um, the item about the Hertfordshire Skills and Employment Strategy. We're presenting it to Cabinet Panel, the third edition of this strategy. Um, uh, we're providing an overview to panel and also inviting panel to comment. Strategy can be seen at Appendix A to this report. Um, the aim of the strategy is to ensure the county's skills provision addresses the local skills challenges as we move into a, a new economic landscape, but also the opportunities uh, and make sure that our, our residents can meet the employment needs of the future. And whilst also supporting all their residents to all the residents to reach their potential. So the need for collective leadership on skills development remains and the County Council, together with Hertfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership and the Department for Work and Pensions, will continue this partnership approach to developing and implementing the strategy. So engagement with skills and employment partners across the county took place earlier this year. Um, to help reshape the strategy uh, and development of the five themes which form the basis of the strategy. You can see that at um, paragraph 4.9 in the report. And the five themes are supported by three cross-cutting priorities, digital strategy, low carbon and clean growth and inclusive growth. So they cover all the strategy, all the themes. Um, so the County Council's interest in the skills and employment agenda is manifold. It covers its interest in the economic health of the county as part of its strategic leadership role, its role as a large employer and its service responsibilities in areas such as children's services and adult and family learning. So officers are currently developing an outcomes framework to provide a way to understand and measure the success of the strategy, but we have included a number of performance measures in the strategy that we will be using. And the progress of the action plan that's part of the strategy will be reported twice a year to this panel, as well as to the LEP skills panel. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed, Kate. Um, it, this is a, a very important document. Um, I know it is, if you like, currently, uh, there's an element of draft about it. Um, there are one or two things to be completed, like in, in terms of the uh, the strategy document, the forward from myself and Adrian Hawkins and so on. Um, but Caroline, um, representing the LEP, would you like to uh, come in and uh, give us your perspective on this and, and how you see the strategy sitting within the uh, the enterprise and the, the, the business side, if you like, of the county? 
Yes, absolutely. It is, it's, uh, thank you, Chair. It's very peculiar. Well, I know I've got a black screen here, but uh, I shall carry on, pretend I'm calling in on, on, on radio. Um, so, yeah, so my role within Hertfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership is I lead on skills in employment and apprenticeship strategy. And I also work very closely with our lead in careers and, of course, closely with my colleagues who are working in um, enterprise and investment. So um, the skills strategy, you know, it has come at a, at a very good time um, because Kate and I, Catherine and I have been working probably very closely um, for a good part of a year um, now. But at the same time, we've been working very closely across all our skills and employment partners across the county. Such a such a, a busy landscape with our colleges, our universities, our job centres, our local authorities, our our chambers. So we've really been talking this year. So to get to the end of that and have our skills and employment strategy is just such a brilliant, a brilliant thing to have. And uh, it's a document, but it's more than a document because a, a huge amount of um, a buy in and um, actions and success outcomes that we'll all be working together across the county. So, yes, uh, we're very pleased uh, that it will be should be um, publicised soon. And it does come on complement a number of other strategies in the region at the moment. So soon um, we we hope to, to publish at the local enterprise partnership our enterprise and innovation strategy. Um, we're also we have our recovery plan, as does Hertfordshire County Council, and that is looking at recovery across our business um, base and also skills and employment. Um, we have a number of sister strategies that we're looking at, um, which you'll read as part of the skills strategy, which is about our places and about our sectors. So um, within Hertfordshire, we have some very exciting sectors. So we're looking at some more deep dives into film and media, our cell and gene and our science um, base and our um, green clean growth strategy. So they again will be published this year and complement the skills strategy. Um, yeah, so um, it's been it's been a really good process for partnership work, I think, throughout Hertfordshire. So looking forward to watching the space and working together to get the actions going. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Caroline. I think that uh, one of the things which is interesting in particular is the fact that um, there's an awful lot of, of connecting elements within the document and indeed within the cover paper. Um, and it, it, it could take a significant while to drill down into all of those. But there's there's there are a number. Um, and there was one which I read a little while ago. So um, the detail um, has passed in that context, but uh, a particularly interesting one. Uh, commissioned by Her Majesty's Lord Lieutenant into uh, young people's um, perceptions of what they felt was going forward um, and how that could impact them. Um, Lawrence, let me come to you. You've got your hand up. No, I, I don't think so. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. I'm sorry. Um, your, ha your face appeared, but your hand didn't. Um, Mark Watkin. Thank you, Terry. Yes, it was my hand, I think, that flashed up, but I don't think it stays up for very long. Um, really, we absolutely welcome this document. Um, it could never be more significant than the present, you know, facing the challenges economically that this county is, as everybody else is, as a result of the COVID crisis. Um, and so I will want to watch this very closely as it actually moves from um, a document into actual uh, performed uh, outcomes and uh, you know where will the impacts be you know it's a strategy there will be bits that will do very well there'll be bits that will do not so well so I think my questions really are twofold one I didn't pick up and maybe I missed it for which I apologize Catherine but I didn't see anything that said money is being allocated specifically to ensure that it will come out of here is is there going to be a financial impact on on the county's budget or others and secondly what will be your criteria for success you know um words are great but actual fact we will want to see some some firm evidence of its of its developing its significance i'm not expecting a miracle in six months but i would like to be able to see some 
I don't know, reduction in the needs, for example, or some investment going on in an area of the, of the county because of this strategy has encouraged employers to, 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 yeah, to. So my question really is, how will you be able to tell us how successful this, this strategy is going to be? I, I think I might um, jump in and answer that, but Catherine can then um, amplify it or correct me insofar as I have asked within the action plan that there be a, a further column um, because it identifies the actions, but I've asked for, and it's not showing at the present time because we're working on how it will actually fit, um, but the evidence of the outcome, because as you rightly say, Mark, um, it's it's great that we say, right, we, we are going to do this, but we need to have the evidence and see the evidence that it, is, it has achieved what the, it what it set out to do. Um, the other thing also that I would just pick up is the fact that, and I think this is the first time, um, there is going to be, be a report coming to this panel every six months, as Kate alluded to earlier on. Um, and that, I think, will give us a, an oversight of how the whole skill strategy is progressing. And it won't just be a situation where the skill strategy runs from 21 to 24, and then in 23 it comes back. It's going to come back twice a year. But I will hand over to Kate to answer your first question about the funding and add, add or did take away anything that I've said. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think uh, regarding the financial impact in the report, we have a paragraph at uh, seven financial considerations. So the strategy does not include new spending for HCC, rather it brings together the partnership plans to ensure partners are working to the same strategic aims. In addition, the strategy provides strength and justification and evidence for, for securing funding to build on the planned activities. And the previous strategies have been successful in attracting funding uh, into Hertfordshire. And that's definitely a, the approach that the partnership wish to continue to make. Um, regarding outcomes, measures of success, we have in the strategy included a number of measures of success. Um, but as I said, we're, we're looking to develop a, an outcomes framework. So we know that we want to reduce the number of NEETs. We know we want to in, increase the number of employers that are disability, uh, that are accredited to the disability confidence scheme. We have a number of indicators as, uh, like that in um, included in the strategy but I think the outcomes framework is 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 an approach that children's services use a lot um, and it's uh, and it's being able to say this is what success will look like so we could be really um, uh, ambitious and say we want full employment uh, and we want all our employers to say we have no skills gap uh, I'm not sure we're going to be that ambitious we may uh, but that's ideally what, what the answer would be, that employers have all the skilled people they need to fill their vacancies and everybody has an opportunity to get work and they can retrain, reskill, upskill to get that work. So those are our ambitions. Mark, did you want to come back? Well, if you don't mind, yes, I would like to just sort of take up Catherine on that point. Um, of course, we all want full employment. We want the best possible employers. I think there's a sort of, you know, motherhood and apple pie, if I might be so cruel. Um, so what I think I'm looking for is a realistic, and it could be a programme year one, we will have hoped to have done this, and year two, we will have hoped to move to another position. In other words, let's be sensible. Okay, we all want to get to that one, you know, there's a future for everybody, but realistically, let's look at something that is measurable and Frankly, it's challenging, but not so far out of reach that actually it's not going to be worth seriously considering. So I think a little bit of qualification on those last comments, Catherine, will be helpful. But yeah, you, you get the point, I think. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, Caroline Clapper. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, a, a comment and a question. Um, firstly, just with regards to the um, Lord Lieutenant's report with which uh, you, Chair, just mentioned, I have to say I read it and it made quite a uh, depressing reading, actually, uh, but I, a really depressing reading. And I think that's probably a document which at some point maybe we should stick on our future work programme to discuss and delve into. But it was extremely well researched. I spoke to a lot of local schools in my area who had participated in it. So um, I think that's a really interesting piece of work that I'd be 
uh, very happy for us to return to at some stage so we can delve into some of that. Um, just wanted to ask a question about, um, you know, kind of along your theme five uh, placemaking uh, for you, Caroline, it's I suppose to what extent we're, we're really taking advantage of the opportunities from big businesses and employers across um, Hertfordshire, County, uh, Hertfordshire County who really do provide excellent, not only training, but upskilling opportunities. And if we're, you know, kind of looking at it in, in the reverse way where perhaps we should be encouraging some of these businesses that we know are so good at doing this sort of thing to actually come to Hertfordshire. So we're kind of starting starting at the top and, and working backwards. So I was just wondering, uh, you know, to, to what extent that's going to work. Um, and just last comment, uh, which is I was very happy to hear um, about the fact that you're going to be uh, looking at a piece of work that's going to be very much focusing on uh, film and media uh, as a Hartsmere councillor. Um, you know, film and media is, is is very big in our area and all the uh, employment opportunities, I think, moving forward are going to be very uh, interesting and exciting for the area. Um, but, yeah, no, I just wanted to know about that that big business um, and to what extent that that's going to be happening. Thank you, Chair. Um, and before Paul, thank you, Caroline, before Carol, uh, Paula Hiscox or Chris Lloyd jump in and, uh, and make the point, of course, Warner Brothers actually sits within uh, um, Three Rivers District. So uh, in the interest of fairness and transparency, um, Caroline, would you mind if I direct your, your question about um, businesses and employment rather than to Kate, but to Caroline Cartwright? Yes, no problem. Yep. Thank you. Caroline, is that something that you can? Yes, of course. On? Yeah. And also um, about the Lord Lieutenant <laughs> report, that was really interesting, Caroline. A lot of schools got involved in that and <clears throat> we are looking very closely at that and how we can support our young people. And, and we do a lot of work on HOP and HOP opportunities portals to do that. So, yeah, we definitely want to do more with that report. Um, so employers, yes, absolutely, they're absolutely key. And it's always twofold in your in your question because it's about our existing big employers, those big brands. And then also there's a bit, I think there was a bit in there about encouraging business to Hertfordshire, the inward investment side. And yes, so we do need to do a lot more with our larger employers. Our larger employers, um, both government and our private sector employers, uh, need to step up and step forward and they are doing we have some brilliant case studies some fantastic careers programs particularly i think with the young people a huge amount of work is going on with the large employers and engagement with young people um but we need to do more on that we could do work around apprenticeship levy transfer for example um, when we talk about funding and, and the skill strategy attached to funding this is one example of how it does work so we, we've just um, got very, very close to um, the end of a tendering process um, for employer engagement, and it will do something like that. So we'll have some skills specialists on the ground working very closely with our employers and SMEs uh, to really work with them, to support them, to understand their skills needs and then engage them with our residents. So that's education. So our young people and also our adult residents. So yes, absolutely, within the employer section, and hopefully that would come come through on the skills strategy, there is work to do. There is good work out there, but more work to do in terms of getting our large employers to fly the flag and work with their communities, their sectors, their supply chain um, to to support them as well. I think... I think uh, thank you. Could I just... Could I just come, sorry, yes, Chair. Oh, sorry. Please Am I allowed to just sorry. come back? come back with just one other comment. I think also when we're speaking to these big businesses as well uh, about the, you know, training and upskilling opportunities, I know that some big businesses, um, for example, also create specific opportunities for care leavers. Um, so I was just going to say, as we are all corporate parents, um, all of us uh, councillors at Hertfordshire County Council, I think it's also important when those conversations happen that those care leavers are also um, mentioned uh, because, you know, if we have opportunities for them specifically, um, I think that that would also be uh, something that each and every one of us would would, would have a duty to, you know, push and and, and try and move forward. That's brilliant and, here. And there's a project starting or imminently starting um, project positive about just that project there, supporting care leavers into apprenticeships. That one is. Oh, that's great. Indeed. Thank you. And indeed, I can't remember the exact number, but we do have a number of care leavers who are uh, taking uh, 
university degrees at the present time, which is absolutely fantastic. Kate, I'll, I'll invite Kate back in in a minute. She may be able to give a figure. Um, I do also know that um, Hertfordshire County Council uh, employs a number of care leavers. Um, you'll never know, but they do, if you like. Um, and one of my ambitions, although it may not come to pass, would be to try and persuade the districts to employ a care leaver, perhaps a care leaver a year, if there is such an opportunity to do so. That would be a great thing, but it may not be feasible, and I, I accept that fully. Um, Kate, do you want to come back on um, any of Caroline, either of the Caroline's comments? Thank you. I was just going to um, uh, confirm about uh, Ca Caroline Cartwright saying about Project Positive, really exciting project underway in Hertfordshire, supporting care leavers into apprenticeships. And yes, I can tell you the figure, we've got 71 care leavers studying at university at this moment. So yes, that it is a, I believe uh, it is a challenge uh, to get into employment um, for some care leavers, but it's not the whole story. So absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. And 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 if you like, as as part of care leavers before they become care leavers and and uh, children in children looked after or children in care, our virtual school does a fantastic job in supporting our young people. Um, and and one of the highlights from my year, any year, is um, to be able to be part of the the annual care leavers or care, children in care awards, which is just inspirational. Um, Hop, by the way, Hertfordshire Opportunities Portal, do have a look at it. It's well worth a visit. Um, it's well worth a vi regular visit because I think that's uh, an acronym you're going to hear a lot of going forward. Um, we're now going to hear a lot more from Mark Mills Bishop going forward. So, Mark. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I welcome the report and I also welcome the fact that it comes under the remit of it comes under this panel. I think that is very uh, uh, helpful and sensible uh, as well. Um, I also wanted to echo the comments of my colleague, uh, Councillor Clapper, uh, regarding the Lord Lieutenant's report. Uh, it did make uh, somewhat depressing reading, um, and I think she is right. And I would urge you, Mr Chairman, that we, we look at this as a separate item uh, at some stage uh, in the future. My question really is for um, Caroline, Caroline Cartwright. Um, uh, welcome to your new role. Um, good luck on that. Uh, I wish you every success. The the question I had really was, uh, do you have any plans about those areas which are uh, perhaps underperforming? Uh, I mean, we realise that one system doesn't fit all. And, and, and I just wonder in terms of a deep dive that you are looking at particular areas where where there is some concern and some work that needs to be done. Uh, I, I mean, I represent a Broxbourne area, uh, so I'm particularly interested in that location. And I just wonder if that is on your uh, radar in terms of um, uh, improving uh, life skills, upskilling, uh, employment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was my answer about underperforming areas. Are we are we doing a bit more other than the one size fits all? Thank well, you. I think, Mark, there's a there's a reference on page 28 uh, where it, it gives a comparative figure between Broxbourne and some of the other boroughs. But Caroline, yeah. please come back. Um, thank you. And so, yes, and I think um, this is how the skills strategy has evolved over the last three years. So this time round, this focus on places and sectors is very much the new theme towards the skills strategy. So within the places theme, um, what one of the, the priority actions would be is to work with our 10 districts and look at working up a skills and employment plan for each of those districts, because this is an overarching strategy which which showcases and highlights, you know, the big stories. But there's nuances and lots of different stories going in with each of the districts. So they may not, and of course, they may not all do it. And that, and that is fine. But we're certainly getting a lot of inroads. And I know we're talking very close with Broxbourne. Um, so that is the next and that's happening. That's going to happen over the next six to 12 months. We'll see locality um, skills and employment plan, uh, plans um, appear. 
and a lot a lot more buying from those local partners and those local and the community and voluntary community sector this is where their part really really sort of plays in that in that local story so yes it's, it's in there and it's absolutely a focus um and yeah broxbourne and all, all the districts of we're working with them on that and i i think it's worth saying mark um that Actually, Caroline has been in this role for at least two years, I think now, because she came and presented to a conference in um, in Robertson House a, a couple of years ago. It must be a couple of years ago because it was pre-pandemic. Um, and if you like, it just shows the, the the raised importance that we are showing to the whole skills agenda um, that perhaps two years ago it didn't have quite the um, the outward recognition that it, it needed and it deserved. And now we are making sure that it's going to get it. Um, Paula, sorry, Mark, did you want to come back at all or not? If I may very quickly on, on, on uh, uh, two points. One, uh, Caroline, uh, I presume that will also include in the partnership approach, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the uh, Hertfordshire Chamber of Commerce, um and not forgetting small businesses as well um but it also highlights the point i think that mark uh, watkin made in terms of that it probably is important as we get a roll through about the outcomes framework and i know uh, uh catherine mentioned it briefly uh, i think it is important to have that kind of of uh, framework in place thank you mr chairman okay thanks mark uh, paula paula hiscox coming um just unmuting thank you chair this is such a good document and it's really setting the scene the way we're going to go forward so much has changed especially in the area i represent because of the pandemic um town centers are nothing like they used to be hospitality is nothing like it used to be we have a lot of and in this report it talks about the 16 to 24 year olds you know being prime case um of unemployment. How are we going to retrain some of these people who worked in these areas? Um, a few questions, if I may. What what areas do we have a shortage of employees in, in Hertfordshire at the moment? How do we encourage the green economy companies, because that's what we want to concentrate on, obviously, with the environment and sustainability into our area? And also, a lot of the big companies in London, where a lot of uh, residents that I know uh, commuted to are going to be doing flexible working if going back at all. Is there any way we could sort of encourage those big companies, I won't name names, but huge ones that operate from London, um, to have hubs or something in our area where maybe for sustainability people aren't travelling into London, but it would also give us employment locally? Thank you, Chair. OK, um, I'm going to come to Catherine, I think, to start um, and and you can pick whichever of those questions you want to answer and then uh, whichever ones you don't answer, we'll go to Caroline Cartwright. Thank you, Chairman. I think I picked up on about the reskilling and the uh, upskilling. And I know Haffles are leading on this, the Adult and Family Learning Service are leading on this. We know that we've got shortages in health and social care. I believe there's something like 4,000 vacancies all the time in health and social care. And if you look on the Hertfordshire Opportunity Portal, it will say what our priority growth industries are. And so if you mindful for that and you're out of work, you would see that, yes, these are the skills that I need to upskill. If you're not, this is where Haffles maybe comes through and the voluntary and community sector come through and people need to think, well, my job has gone and I'm not going to get another job in this area. So what are my transferable skills? You know, there's so many job coaches being employed by the Department for Work and Pensions. Um, Haffles will 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 support people with um, employment and, and reskilling. So there is, is support out and sorry, and the voluntary community sector do this sort of thing as well. So there is support out there. And I suppose in the first instance, it would be to, to your local job centre to to talk through your options because there is a lot of support out there. It's just 
signposting people to that and the the hop is a, a fabulous portal that is fairly new in Hertfordshire and I think we're fairly unusual in having it as well we're very lucky to have it and so yeah I would yes in answer to your question about that I think I've answered that I'm I'm going to pass on to Caroline because I think you were talking about investment of, of larger companies coming into Hertfordshire and I think that's more the, the that's definitely more the LEP than HCC. Caroline? Um, thank you. Um, yeah, there was a couple of points there. So in, in terms of retraining, um, there's lots of national programmes coming through, like Lifetime Skills Guarantee. Uh, we've got digital boot camps. So what's happening is there's a process of lots of providers attending for that, using the skills strategy to write up their proposals. What should they be retraining in Hertfordshire? That's the film and media, the health, the science. Um, so you'll see those programmes come through and this is why HOP is good because that will be the central place. That's where it will all be showcased and promoted. Uh, we've got an Institute of Technology um, being scoped out at the moment. Our university's got through to the last stages. That would be fabulous. So this is your progression through to levels four, five, six, seven um, in, in technical skills. So they're, they're through to the last round in that. Um, and, and you mentioned some interesting... Oh. You talked about London, and I think it's, it's going to be fascinating for Hertfordshire over the over the next few years to see that impact. So, if you look within the skills strategy and further within our local skills reports, the data is is not great for Hertfordshire in terms of the huge amount of skilled workers we have leaving our county. We we export our skilled talent, um, and perhaps we don't need to do that anymore because these these London companies could um, come to Hertfordshire with hubs. Um, people don't need to go into London. And, and some other stories I could tell you, um, which are not great in terms of, so our, our science community, we have a, a huge cell and gene cluster in, in Hertfordshire. I know they've recruited about 15 apprenticeships in the last year. I think one came from the local area. That, you know, that's not good. They should be all coming from the local schools. So this is this work where we need to connect our residents to our employers. The residents are there. The employees are there. It's just that connection and having that place to showcase it all. So that's a, it's going to be a huge area, I think, over the next year, next years and longer um, in terms of the opportunities there in Hertfordshire. Absolutely. Our industries are so exciting. So our residents need to be going for those jobs on their doorsteps and our employers need to be recruiting them. So it's facilitating that and, and the skills strategy does talk about that a lot. And that's where the whole reskilling element comes in, because if you take Stevenage, for example, I think, um, and it may be slightly out of date, that it was almost a net, um, it was a net exporter of 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 semi-skilled, um, and and it was an importer of skilled people. And we need to actually skill up those people that they are actually employed within the areas that they actually reside as much as we possibly can. In at and at various levels, um, I I think we'll we'll take Jan Madden and then I think we'll probably um, bring it to a close and perhaps ask uh, Catherine and Caroline if they want to uh, say any words in closing. But uh, Jan, over to you. Thank you. Mine was just a really quick one actually. Um, it was picking up from something you said, Terry, um, about the care leavers in in uh, being employed by Hertfordshire County Council and that it's something that you were hoping the districts would take up. And I just wondered if there's anything that any of us who are also district councillors can help to achieve that. Well, I have to say that is a purely per my personal aspiration, whether or not it will be feasible. It may not be. Um, I think it's it, a great it, idea. It's a nice it's a nice aspiration to have. And if we can, um, then that would be, as you say, it's, it would be a nice idea. And uh, um i think that's where i would leave it so uh, yeah but thank you for that um catherine do you do you want to say anything in summing up thank you chairman just wanted to say thank you very much for all the comments been really interesting to hear um and thank you for the feedback that's helpful to us um we look forward to coming back to you in in six months time with our report um, on the progress and some proper measures of success uh, and targets that you can all um, buy into. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Caroline, did you have any um, final words? 
Thank you, Terry. No, I don't think I do. I think uh, Kate summed that up. So yeah, we're very much looking forward to to making these actions happen now. Excellent. Thank you. And I have to say, I very much look forward to hearing the next report come back in six months time and to be able to look and say, see how we are uh, progressing along the journey. And uh, I think one of the words that we're going to be hearing a bit of is pace. So um, we will be progressing along the journey at some level of pace, which is no bad thing. Um, colleagues, the recommendation um, at 3.1 is for the cabinet panel to comment, which you all have, I believe, um, on the draft strategy and recommend its adoption to cabinet. Um, can I ask you to vote in the chat, um, please, whether you're for, against or abstain? Stephanie, I didn't get there in time, uh, I don't think. So can you put me down as a four, please? Everybody else clicked in and I was busy doing other stuff. So uh, there we go. Oh, that was Michelle. I could have I could have gone in after all. Right. Thank you very much indeed for that. We move now to the Hertfordshire County Council's admission arrangements for 2021 to 2022 and for 2022 to 2023. Delighted to welcome Glenda Hardy and Jane Avery. Uh, Glenda is Head of Admissions and Transport and Jane is um, the guru of all <laughs> things um, admissions and transport. I'm not <laughs> quite sure now, I, I got it down on my crib sheet that Jane was going to uh, introduce this. But knowing you two, I'm not quite sure which one's going to go first. So who's going first? Go on, Glenda. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I just wanted to come along today and introduce myself, but Terry has just um, remembered my job title. Uh, Jane is actually policy and strategy manager for the team uh, and obviously works alongside myself. But I say Jane is going to um, present the, the paper, but I just wanted to come along and introduce myself to those new members who don't know me or, or the service, really. I believe that Simon has done um, a brief overview induction. We're aiming um, to do a, a, a broader induction in the new term, um, which would fit in with the cycle of emissions and make more sense at that time, really. And that will be emissions, transport and our colleagues in school place planning. I just wanted to say, those of you that know me already know this, and, and obviously already know Jane, but for the new um, members, uh, please do not ever hesitate to come direct to myself or Jane. Um, probably at the moment, because of the way we're working, it's probably best to email in the first instance, because the, the phone portal doesn't always um, work necessarily as it should. So you were guaranteed to get a reply and guaranteed to get a swift reply um, if you come direct to us because I can assure you at if you haven't already you will get contact May the second uh, March the second um, and April the 16th if that's the right date for primary and secondary um, um, transfers possibly throughout the year as well with in-year emissions but less so but please do not ever hesitate I'm Glenda Hardy and Jane Avery um, I'll hand over to um to jane Avery, the guru <laughs> now thank you uh the poli the policy and strategy manager got it right i've so never been called guru before i i think i'm flattered thank oh, you, you, Mr. you should be carry um, on jane carry on thanks 
Um, this item is basically a technical and legal item uh, required because a change in the legislation surrounding school admissions nationally um, and required by the new school admissions code that's currently lying before Parliament. Um, we'll have confirmation by tomorrow uh, whether the code's gone through Parliament, but I have no doubt that it will. Um, so there's a requirement for all admitting authorities, that's local authorities and all schools that act as their own admitting authority to amend their existing um, admission arrangements in line with the new code. So these are mainly technical and legal changes for Hertfordshire because um, because obviously I'm a guru. Our, our arrangements already fundamentally deliver what the new code requires. Um, there, there are two specific um, items. One is the um, amendment to rule one. That's the highest uh, oversubscription criteria that currently requires all admitting authorities to give the highest priority to children previously pre children looked after or previously looked after in England and Wales. That's been the bone of contention for the DfE and um, other agencies for a number of years. And that rule one now must include children previously looked after abroad, well, outside England and subsequently adopted. We previously had that category of children um, looked after abroad in our rule two. So this technical change will require a change to both our rule one and our rule two, both of which are clearly outlined um, in the paper. Very little, if any, impact upon our allocations, because, as I said, we've already got those children prioritised as our second highest priority. But all other admitting authorities are also required to undertake this change, which should mean that any child now with any previously looked after status or indeed looked after status will get in under the highest admission criteria. I've just seen that Mark's got his hand up. Do you want me to get to the end, Chair, and uh, then come yes, to questions? Let's, let's, let, let's get to the end and then we'll bring Mark in. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the second uh, change is, is really um, a tweak um, to our existing uh, operational explanation around uh, service personnel and Crown servants. Currently, uh, this group of children are already um, an exception to um, admissions processing, as in um, all admitting authorities are required to um, accept applications from abroad, understandably, for military families and uh, service personnel, um, if they're accompanied by a postings um, address. Um, and clarification from a commanding officer, for example. This, this code um, requires um, admitting authorities to also take into account a private address as opposed to just a military address for those families moving back into the UK. We already do this, but to provide absolute clarity and transparency, um, we propose that we absolutely amend our definitions around Crown servants and service personnel to include the text um, I put in the report, as long as the parents provide some evidence the address and the child will be living there. And that's the only amendment we need to our arrangements because we already look at private addresses for those categories of children. They're the two changes. Um, as I said, we are required to undertake those changes because of the new code and we are required to implement for September uh, 21. And that requires changes to two sets of admission arrangements, our 21-22 admission arrangements, which will just deal with in-year admissions, because obviously we've done the allocations for September 21 already, and for the September 22-23 allocation round, which will be opening in September. Thank you very much indeed, Jane. And, and just uh, for returning members, um, we, we put the um, issue of children looked after uh, coming from outside England into Rule 2, because if you like, as a temporary measure until um, we had the capacity by virtue of the legislation to actually move it into uh, Rule 1. And that's why, if you like, it, it is very much a technical item. But Mark Watkin, you've got your hand up. Yes, and I'm sorry to interrupt the guru in the middle of her speech. Sorry, Jane, I wasn't uh, meaning to disturb you. Um, and look, absolutely support these. Um, and I, I, I guess all I'm really going to ask is a bit of clarification on the first one, evidence of, of what a child looked after abroad. 
um, are there legal documents that would need to be produced? Is it going to be difficult for them to generate that uh, evidence? Because sometimes their lives may not have been as straightforward as they would be over here. And as to the second one, uh, I know this was in the private uh, education sector, but we've all been aware of some very major publicity around officers who've been claiming to live in one place and that they weren't. So. I know it's not of the same significance. Money is not being uh, an element here, but are we confident that we, you know, that we will be given the right information and it's valid and can be checked if we need to? Uh, that, Mark, actually, is a really good question, and it was one of the main bones of contention when the DfE has asked for feedback about including this category of children. Um, we um, and there is no guarantee that there will be really clear, a really clear evidence or audit trail about the background of these children. But what we're doing, again, following the advice from the DfE, um, is uh, referring to our virtual school. Um, our virtual school um, officers and head have got massive amounts of experience with children um, in the uh, care system, both at home and abroad, and we will be deferring to their decision making about clarifying um, any any claims um, that, that we are potentially unsure of. That offer is also open to any school in Hertfordshire. And we have um, officers from the virtual school involved in the process to help us, um, well, to, to aid us in making those decisions when there, we don't have that clarity of information. But I have to emphasise, this is a tiny number. I think we've had one application this year across the whole primary and secondary transfer processes, and that's in excess of 30,000 applications. Does that answer your question, Mark? It answers it answers the first one perfectly. Um, I don't know whether Jane wanted to make a comment about the military uh, one, which again is not a big issue, so I don't want to spend too long on it. I just want a clarification that, that again we know how to be able to substantiate uh, applications that fit that category. Yes, can and I, I think in, that, can I just sorry. jump in there because mm -hmm. I, I, I the one thing I think that. Um, we have actually across the piece been getting hotter and hotter and we are pretty much at boiling point on this is the investigation of any um, fraudulent claims uh, going forward in terms of uh, domiciliary arrangements or, or wherever people may be living. This this helps to, I hope, um, clarify it a little bit. But rest assured, if we if we get a um, any evidence of people misusing and abusing the system illegally, then we will be after them. And don't forget, once they do that, if they are caught, they lose all their um, application capacity and they go to the bottom of the list. So, Jane, sorry. Um, a few a few points on that. Firstly, Terry is absolutely right. We do a huge amount of work to prevent uh, fraudulent addresses uh, being used in the first place. And if they are used, we've got um, a, a number of, uh, of, of different avenues that we pursue with schools um, to try and ensure that we don't have anyone um, accessing um, a school place based on a fraudulent address. I think the code's very helpful in, um, in that it now actually clarifies that even military personnel have to provide some evidence of the address they will be moving into and that the child will be living there, which is what we require for any other application as well. Um, just a slight clarification, Terry, if a child um, does have a fraud address and we prove that we can absolutely take that place away but that child would still have to be ranked accordingly to um their their appropriate application and address unfortunately we couldn't just put them at the bottom although i wish we could you see that's why you're a guru <laughs> <laughs> chris chris lloyd uh, fa thanks terry yeah i know that the uh your team has been checking addresses for for many many years and uh, obviously uh, as governors we're aware of part of the process so yeah I, um, I i would support both changes but my question relates obviously we have a lot of uh, schools in our end of the county watford hartsmere and three rivers where we have other admitting authorities and as part of our interaction, because I think that's our responsibility as well, I assume that we'll be uh, suggesting to them that they need to also be making the same changes that we are if they haven't already done so. Yes, um, I mean, the DfE um, 
I have no doubt has has contacted all own emitting authorities, but we've already sent out mm -hmm. um, a really clear briefing note to every own emitting authority in the county with a clear call to action about not just these changes to the code, which the relevant ones to Hertfordshire as an emitting authority, but to any other changes that they're required to enact before September. And most of those other changes um, relate to the in-year admissions processes where there's fundamental change for, for a lot of schools, but again, not for Hertfordshire because we already do what the code uh, requires us to do around in-year. So there should be no lack of clarity for any school about what they're required to do before September. But again, I just want to reiterate what Glenda said. If anyone e ever has any queries about um, admissions. We always welcome uh, schools, members, parents to come direct to us. We'd rather assist in advance than, than to help after something's gone wrong. But thank you very much. One, one of the things that um, struck me a, a long while ago, actually, in terms of admissions, we, we have, um, I don't know, 12, 13,000 primary admissions every year, same number of secondary admissions. Um, and the vast majority of them just proceed. Um, but there's there's a, a relatively small number that that have issues. And it it is very comforting to know that if you say to Glenda or Jane or any of the folks actually in the admissions team, what about so and so? Oh yes, they say, we know, um, we wrote to them. They have they have such a close relationship and try to support those people, some of whom may have not got it quite right in the first place, some of whom are genuinely dis terribly disappointed by this. But um, the sometimes people think that they get a hard, a hard time from admissions, but they play it by the book, but they are also very compassionate. Thank you, Terry. That's very kind. Um, I don't see any other hands. And on that basis, um, I don't know. I'm, I, I will read the whole thing just so that everybody is clear. Um, it's at item 3.1. Panel is asked to note and comment upon the report and recommend to Cabinet that the County Council admissions arrangements for 2021 stroke 2022 and 2022 to 2023 are varied in line with the requirements of the new school admission code. Uh, rule one of the County Council's oversubscription criteria is amended to include all previously looked after children, including those who appear to the admission authority to have been in state care outside England and cease to be in state care as a result of being adopted. And the definition and explanation regarding the allocation of places to children of service personnel and Crown servants is amended to specifically reflect the new code. These variations are conditional upon the code passing through its parliamentary process on or around the 1st of July, as the Guru has said. Um, if you could please um, vote for, against or abstain, that would be much appreciated. I think I know where this is going, but I'll wait. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, ladies, very much indeed. Have thank a you good very much, Terry. Yep, and Bye -bye. thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. Let's let's turn now to the outcome of the public consultation on the proposal to change the age range of OPSI Early Years Centre to enable school, the school to offer nursery provision to two year old children from January 2022. Um, and we welcome Melanie Knowles. Hello, Melanie. Would you like to uh, just introduce this? I'm, I'm sure everybody will have read it. Um, I, I have to, no, I'm not going to steal any of your words, so you carry on. <laughs> okay, thank, uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm, and for those of you that don't know me, I'm Melanie Knowles. I'm the head of the early year service within HCC, so anything early years related tends to sit under um, my remit. 
On this occasion, I'm here to present um, the outcome of the public consultation regarding lowering the admission admission age of Oxy Early Years Centre, which is a maintained nursery school in Hertfordshire, from three, which it currently is, down to two, which would bring it into line with 13, no, 12 of the other maintained nursery, 12 of the 13 other maintained nursery schools. Um, as you can see from the um, report, predominantly the outcome has been very positive and um, people are in favour of this. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, to be perfectly honest, I, if you like, there's an element of what's not to like about this, but yeah. uh, I'm not seeing any questions or comments. Um, we'll, we will wait a moment in case. But the, the report makes it very clear. And I think probably we can. No, nobody's indicating so. Uh, let's go to the vote um, and if you can do it for against and abstain in the normal way, please. I think I probably should have told you what you were voting for. Because there were three options. Um, you have voted to accept the proposal and authorise the Director of Children's Services to publish a statutory notice. So I do apologise for that. If anybody um, is exercised by that, I apologise. I, I didn't read that bit out, but I think it's um, accepted. I think everybody knew what we were we were talking about, and uh, so thank you, Melanie. You can thank you very uh, much. You can proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Most most welcome. Thank you. Cheers. So we now come to um, additional item seven: additional school places um, relating to the Priory School in Hitchin. Um, does anybody have Mark? Yes. Mark Watkins. Uh, does anybody have Mark? That's a bit of a worry. <laughs> My wife, I think. Um, yes, uh, Terry, you, you will know that I was going to do this and I have had advice from officers. I just want to let the rest of the panel know that my daughter uh, is a head of year at the Priory School, which uh, I'm going to say is a superb establishment. And uh, it's interesting that this is the second piece of uh, second paper that's come to this panel in recent time about that school, which is an indication of its uh, of its uh, facilities and, and, and what it's delivered, the quality of education it's delivering. So uh, we'll have no doubt where I'm sitting on this. But technically, <laughs> I am. Um, by the way, in, for clarification, I've been advised I may vote. So that's fine once I've declared my interest. And as I've said what I'm going to say, I will not say it again. Thank you. No, uh, I, I was aware, Mark, and I, I'm also very aware that you are absolutely entitled to vote as well. So uh, that's good. Um, just colleagues to remind you that there is a part one and a part two. Um, you could, if if in the beginning you contain yourself just to um, the non financial elements, uh, they will be discussed as required in part two. There will be some recommendations that we will need to take in part two before coming back to um, part one for the final recommendation and approval. So I think this is being presented either by Simon Newland or Pauline Davis, who is who is um, making this presentation. Me. <laughs> Pauline, welcome. Yes, uh, I should have Kate Leahy with me. Is she with us at the moment? I don't know. No, she isn't. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Pauline Davis. I'm the head of school planning, but I am a joint head of school planning because I job share with Kate Leahy, who was hoping to be here this afternoon. Um, so in future, 
Uh, on school place planning issues, you may see either me or Kate, depending on the item involved. But I'm here this afternoon to uh, talk to you about the need to expand the Priory School as a foundation secondary school in Hitchin. Uh, you will have the report in front of you, which um, identifies the need for additional places to serve Hitchin. And our assessment is that we need to expand this school by one form of entry. It has been helping out on a temporary basis for a couple of years, but they need permanent accommodation if they are to continue to do that. This doesn't constitute um, a prescribed alteration under the school organisation uh, regulations um, because of the level of expansion. So what we're asking you here today is to agree to um, the expansion of this school, the funding to uh, facilitate that. And in addition, you will see in the report, in the part one report, that we are also asking for permission um, to allocate um, Section 106 funding to previous school expansions projects, as we have done several times in the past through your panel. Thank you very much. We, wel we welcome Kate Leahy. Um, Kate, did you want to add anything to that which uh, Pauline has said? And you're you're in the immortal words, you are on, on mute. mute. So I've had terrible trouble with my uh, joining the meeting. So apologies. Um, I'm sure Pauline's covered it all off. I just wanted to introduce myself to the panel as um, Pauline's job share um, in school planning. And uh, that, that was it from me. Thank you, Terry. It's all going very, very rapidly. Um, do we have any questions? I mean, I have to say this is this makes eminently good sense. Um, a, apart from anything else, it equalises up um, the, the forms of entry across the three schools in the area. Um, the Priory School is a great school. Um, it really is. Um, and, and it's a popular school. So to actually get this level of, of stability, not stability, but um, ongoing facility in in a in a permanent form, I think has to be good. Has to be good for the school. Has to be good for um, the the people of Hitchin and and the areas that it it serves. Um, dare I say, it also has to be good for Mark Watkins' daughter as well. So, uh, I th I think that's it. It's 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 a win win all the way through. Uh, Caroline Clapper, you have your hand up. Thank thank you, Chair. I'm going to attempt to put my camera on and hope it it doesn't it. Nobody, I, I don't freeze or anyone else freezes. Um, I'm, I am, I am supportive of this, but there's just a, a question that I, I suppose I wanted to raise as a, as a matter for discussion. Um, and I suppose I'm coming at this with my um, environment um, head on and talking about sustainability. Um, and I do understand the need for the expansion of this school and I understand the need for whenever one of these we, we deal with these expansion matters quite frequently on this panel um, but I suppose I just wanted us to be cognizant of the fact that you know from a sustainability perspective our schools are creating the biggest output of carbon emissions out, out of anything across the county as I understand um, a huge amount of carbon emissions and each time we make a decision like this we are moving further away from our sustainability aims um, with regards to the output that we as an authority are creating. So, I mean, I, I don't really know what the what the answer to this is, um, because I understand that we need to make these expansions. But I just do think we need to consider that each time we do make an, ex an expansion in a school like this, we are adding to the issue rather than looking at the, the, the greater issue. And we've got this target of, you know, zero zero carbon by 2030 um so i know that there's lots of threads from lots lots of different panels that work into other panels um but i suppose this is bringing the sustainability thread in into this panel um and i was just wondering how we are making these considerations when we look at each of these expansions in in isolation thank you chair can i pick that up um and and slightly t turn it around a little bit and say to Pauline and to Kate, it's always difficult when you're doing an expansion because it 
the chances are that the expansion is going to be reliant upon certain of the infrastructure facilities in terms of perhaps the heating or the boilers or whatever it may be of the main school. Now, if that is the case in this situation, is there an, a, an ability to design something in so it can be more easily retro adapted to be net zero carbon operational um, rather than being not in X years time. Kate, do you want to take that? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, absolutely. That, that's the approach we're taking, Terry, um, in terms of making sure that certainly for this, which will be a um, school delivered project, making sure the funding agreement picks up those points, not only making sure that the new building uh, looks to attain um, good sustainability criteria, but also looking at any um, opportunities to enhance retrofit as well. So mm -hmm. um, that that's specific to this scheme, but more widely, obviously, looking at how we approach building moving forward and making sure that um, sustainability is something we're looking at at the outset of projects and how we can best ensure our buildings are um, as, uh, for example, net zero in operation. Um, and that's something that we're making sure we embed in in all our schemes from the outset moving forward. So I hope that gives you some reassurance in that regard. Does that give you some comfort, Caroline? Yeah, no, 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 no it does. It does. And as I said, I am I am actually um, supportive of this. I do understand the need for it. I'm happy to vote for Mark Watkins' daughter. Um, <laughs> I, I suppose I did just want the, the, the reassurance that, you know, whenever we're looking at these projects in the back of our, our minds, in the back of everyone's minds, um, we're just you know, mindful of the targets that we need to achieve um, and mindful of the duty, I suppose, that we have as a local authority um, as the biggest, you know, outputter of carbon emissions to, to you know, try and do do all that we can. So thank you very much. I'm really pleased to hear that you guys are looking at that. And I, I know that we're building our first our first um, net zero school as well, which is really exciting. And we'll see the outcomes of that. So I just wanted to make sure that it's, it, it sounds like it's very clearly on everyone's mind. So that's good. Thank you very much. Well, I, I can add to that, Caroline, because you, you've referenced the net zero carbon school in Buntingford, which is an infant school. Um, I, I should probably, in the interests of absolute clarity, say that it's going to be a net zero carbon operational school, because my understanding, and, and Pauline will either throw a metaphorical axe at me, um, but to be pure net zero carbon, it, in, it means that all the people traveling to the school have to be um, net, net zero carbon as well. And they have to go either by bicycle or whatever. They, they, there can't be any impact upon the environment. Um, so that's why you'll see the words net zero carbon operation. The other thing to say, which is, I think, extremely exciting, um, is that um, um, the answer to the question about can the panel visit Buntingford School when restrictions allow? Well, yes, but we've got to build it first. <laughs> we haven't built it yet, but certainly when we, Mark, you will be, we will make sure you're one of the first to go to Buntingford. Um, um, but what I was going to say, uh, which is really exciting news, is that we are rebuilding the Valley School in Stevenage. And I was at the um, exhibition for that last week. And my understanding is that that actually also is going to be a net zero carbon operational school um, and it's designed to be like that. So the, there was a concern initially that some that the building cost of net zero net zero carbon was going to be higher. Now, we are seeing an increase in building costs, but I think that it's possibly fair to say that the in, that there may be a reduction in the cost of net zero carboning because of different types of construction techniques so the the it it could make it more affordable i hope i haven't gone too far out on a limb um i am getting smiles so um kate do you want to uh, correct or endorse what i've said no i mean i think absolutely the position we're taking is that we should be aiming to achieve net zero carbon in operation which is how the school will operate um when 
uh, when it's up and running and making sure that we are absolutely investing in those sustainable measures up front, um, which will align us with um, government policy moving forward. Um, and that with Buntingford, the, the, uh, there is a slight difference it just in terms of the fact that we're also as a pilot looking to ensure that we reduce embodied carbon construction um which is which 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 is why Buntingford specifically a pilot but absolutely um for example with the valley we are looking at um net zero carbon in operations and hoping to achieve that as you said moving forward within our existing budget parameters um and and so far we're managing to achieve that on for example the valley so yes yeah. it is good news in that regard yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, right. I'm not seeing any other hands. So now I have to go to. Uh, I have to go. I have to go to here and not. Um, and by virtue of paragraph three of part one of the schedule 12A of the Local Government Act 1972, that under um, that section a and section 100a brackets four of the local government act the present public be excluded from the meeting for the following items of business on the grounds that they are likely to involve um, a disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph three of part one of schedule 12a to the said act and the public interest is ma in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information. So we will um, ask the public to leave us and then we will call them back once we have uh, considered.
OK, so uh, welcome back to uh, members of the public and the press who are watching in. Um, colleagues, you have considered the um, items in part two. You have made a recommendation to part one, which is where we are now. And I would draw your attention, please, to the recommendation as detailed in paragraph 3.1 of the part one papers. I won't read them out um, because they are there on the papers. So could I ask you to vote for, against or abstain, please? Thank you very much indeed, colleagues. That has been agreed. So um, that pretty much concludes the business. I was just going to mention that um, in the induction this morning, um, in fact, I, I'm, I think it's been agreed. There's some late fours coming in. Terry, we have been told it's been agreed. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I, I, I thought it had. There was a number of uh, late fours popping up on on my on my list, so that's why I was slightly confused. Yeah, um, yep. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Mark. Um, just to let you know that the, the next meeting of this panel is in July. Um, as part at the end of the meeting, not part of the meeting, but at the end of the meeting, there will be a presentation uh, to allow you to hear more about the work of Haffles in particular um, going forward. And, and that will also be helpful in understanding its role within the, uh, the, the work of the skills agenda that we talked about earlier on. But in the meantime, that concludes the business for today. Um, Lawrence, you've got your hand up. I just wanted to know, perhaps I've, I'm not familiar with the way you operate, uh, Chairman, but have we had any other business item eight? Uh, there is no other business which I am aware of or is of sufficient, well, nothing that I have been advised of, um, and therefore I, the, there is nothing that I have been able to give consideration to if it is of sufficient urgency to warrant consideration. Well, so does that mean we, we can't raise items of other business under this heading? Well, I think if you if you had raised anything beforehand or if you would have alerted me to it, then I could have given it consideration. And if I felt that it was of sufficient import, um, then I would have allowed it to be part of the agenda. But without that, that's the way I work. I, I am very happy to take um, to hear from Stephanie or uh, Debbie um, to confirm that that is my understanding is correct. Stephanie, Debbie, any yes, comment? It's correct. It has to meet the legal um, definition of being sufficiently urgent to be heard before the next agenda. Yeah. There we go. That, there's your answer, Lawrence. Well, it's it's sort of an answer, but you don't know what the question was. So you don't know if it's urgent or not, but I'll well, raise it at the county council meeting. Well, the point the point being, Lawrence, if you had raised it beforehand, um, if you had raised it beforehand, then I could have considered whether it was of sufficient urgency. And if it if I had a, if it had been, then it would have been included in the agenda. Um, that's that's the way it, it works. Well, I'm obliged. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not familiar with your procedures in future. Then uh, one has to give notice to you immediately prior to the meeting or is there a certain number of days or something or how does it work? Um, I have to say we we get very little um, any other business um, to be perfectly honest. I can't remember the last time we did have. So um, but certainly I would say. 48 hours beforehand. 
48 hours working, 48 working hours beforehand, I would have thought, um, unless it is of sufficient urgency, but there are rarely things which are of sufficient urgency. Mark, do you want to come in? Only briefly, Terry, just to say, uh, I have a guess what Lawrence is going to raise, and I'm not going to speak for him or about it, but I think it is sensible to give officers a chance to prepare a, a, a comment on anything that might be raised under AOB. So um, on the basis that you will be sympathetic to any point that Lawrence wants us to raise, um, I would ask that, yes, you know, I would say to you, Lawrence, just give the officers a chance to, to put some words together. Um, if you do raise it at the meeting, the answers are will almost certainly be we will we'll have to hold that over until we've had a chance to think about it and, and discussion won't be very, very fruitful. So my advice to you as a colleague is absolutely go for it, but give the officers a chance at least to prepare a, a response. And uh, Terry, I'm sure you'll be sympathetic to what Lawrence wants to ask you. Well, it, it, yes, I mean, it will depend entirely on, on what the question is, what the substance is. Um, and I really have to wait and see what the um, what Lawrence's question is going to be, or what his any other business item is going to be. I, I, I don't want to prolong people's agony here. Um, I, 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 I wanted to ask your opinion about security. Well, Lawrence, 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 Lawrence if, you, if you want to ask my opinion, um, then by all means, um, um, call me up on Teams afterwards and we can have a one to one and you can ask my opinion that way, because that sounds as though you're seeking my opinion. So on the record, I wanted your opinion. I will deal with it at the county meet, county council meeting uh, shortly. And I'm very grateful for your uh, your uh, patience. Thank you very much. OK, well, I think I think your colleague Mark Watkin has also um, given you um, some guidance. So uh, and I'm grateful to him. So on that basis, thank you very much indeed, colleagues. So that concludes the meeting and uh, we will see you on the 16th of July um, at 10 o'clock in the morning. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Terry. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, ladies.